Chapter 4, Part 1 of American Men of Action by Burton Egbert Stevenson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Tomko. Lincoln and His Successors, Part 1. And so we have come down through the years to Abraham Lincoln, that patient and gentle man whose memory ranks with Washington's as America's priceless heritage, a blessing and an inspiration, a mystery too, an enigma among men, lonely and impressive, not fully understood nor understandable to the depths of that great heart of his, not fully explainable, for what strange power was it lifted that ignorant, ill-bred, uncouth, backwoods boy to a station among the stars. Seldom has any man who started so low mounted so high. Abraham Lincoln's early life was of the most miserable description. His father, Thomas Lincoln, was a worthless rover. His mother, Nancy Hanks, was of a poor white Virginia family with an unenviable record. His birthplace was a squalid log cabin in Washington County, Kentucky. His surroundings were such as are commonly encountered in a coarse, low, ignorant, poverty-stricken family. His father was at the very bottom of the social scale, so ignorant he could scarcely write his name. His mother inherited the shiftlessness and carelessness which is part and parcel of poor white. These things are incontestable. They must be looked in the face. And yet, in spite of them, in spite of such a handicap as few other great men ever approximated, Abraham Lincoln emerged to be the leader of a race. In 1816, Thomas Lincoln decided he would remove to Indiana. Abraham was at that time seven years old, and for a year after the removal, the family lived in what was called a half-faced camp, fourteen feet square, that is to say, a covered shed of three sides, the fourth side being open to the weather. Then the family achieved the luxury of a cabin, but a cabin without floor or door or window. Amid this wretchedness, Lincoln's mother died and was laid away in a rough coffin of slabs at the edge of the little clearing. Three months later, a passing preacher read the funeral service above the grave. Thomas Lincoln soon married again and, strangely enough, made a wise choice, for his new wife not only possessed furniture enough to fill a four-horse wagon, but what was of more importance, was endowed with a thrifty and industrious temperament. That she should have consented to marry the ne'er-do-well is a mystery. Perhaps he was not without his redeeming virtues, after all. She made him put a floor and windows in his cabin, and she was a better mother to his children than their real one had ever been. For the first time, young Abraham got some idea of the comforts and decencies of life and, as his stepmother put it, began to look a little human. He was not an attractive object, even at best, for he was lanky and clumsy, with great hands and feet, and his skin permanently wrinkled and shriveled. By the time he was seventeen, he was six feet tall, and he soon added two more inches to his stature. Needless to say, his clothes never caught up with him, but were always too small. His schooling was of the most meager description. In fact, in his whole life, he went to school less than one year. Yet there soon awakened within the boy a trace of unusual spirit. He actually liked to read. He saw few books, but such as he could lay his hands on, he read over and over. That one fact alone set him apart at once from the other boys of his class. To them, reading was an irksome labor. All this reading had its effect. He acquired a vocabulary. That is to say, instead of the few hundred words which were all the other boys knew by which to express their thoughts, he soon had twice as many. Besides that, he soon got a reputation as a wit and storyteller. And his command of words made him fond of speech-making. He resembled most boys in liking to show off. He had learned, too, that there were comforts in the world which he need never look for in his father's house and so as soon as he was of age he left that unattractive dwelling-place and struck out for himself making a livelihood in various ways by splitting rails running a river-boat managing a store enlisting for the black hawk war doing anything in a word that came to hand and would serve to put a little money in his pocket he came to know a great many people and so in eighteen thirty two he proclaimed himself a candidate for the state legislature for sangamon county illinois where he had made his home for some years 
No doubt, to most people, his candidacy must have seemed in the nature of a joke, and though he stumped the country thoroughly and entertained the crowds with his stories and flashes of wit, he was defeated at the polls. That episode ended. He returned to storekeeping, but he had come to see that the law was the surest road to political preferment, and so he spent such leisure as he had in study, and in 1836 was admitted to the bar. As has been remarked before, the requirements for admission were anything but prohibitory, most lawyers sharing the oft-quoted opinion of Patrick Henry that the only way to learn law was to practice it. Lincoln decided to establish himself at Springfield, opening an office there, and for the next twenty years practiced law with considerable success, riding from one court to another, and gradually extending his circle of acquaintances. He even became prosperous enough to marry, and in 1842, after a courtship of the most peculiar description, married a Miss Mary Todd, a young woman somewhat above him in social station, and possessed of a sharp tongue and uncertain temper which often tried him severely. It was inevitable, of course, that he should become interested again in politics, and he threw in his fortunes with the Whig Party, serving two or three terms in the state legislature and one in Congress. All of this did much to temper and chasten his native coarseness and uncouthness, but he was still just an average lawyer and politician with no evidence of greatness about him, and many evidences of commonness. Then, suddenly, in 1858, he stood forth as a national figure, in a contest with one of the most noteworthy men in public life, Stephen A. Douglas. Douglas was an aggressive, tireless, and brilliant political leader the acknowledged head of the Democratic Party, and had represented Illinois in the Senate for many years. He had a great ambition to be president, had missed the nomination in 1852 and 1856, but was determined to secure it in 1860, and was carefully building to that end. His term as senator expired in 1858, and his re-election seemed essential to his success. Of his re-election he had no doubt, for Illinois had always been a Democratic state, though it was becoming somewhat divided in opinion. The southern part was largely pro-slavery, but the northern part, including the rapidly growing city of Chicago, was inclined the other way. This division of opinion made Douglas's part an increasingly difficult one, for pro-slave and anti-slave sentiment were as irreconcilable as fire and water. Lincoln, meanwhile, had been active in the formation of the new Republican Party in the state, had made a number of strong speeches, and on June 16, 1858, the Republican Convention resolved that Honorable Abraham Lincoln is our first and only choice for United States Senator to fill the vacancy about to be created by the expiration of Mr. Douglas's term of office. A month later, Lincoln challenged Douglas to a series of joint debates. Douglas at once accepted, never doubting his ability to overwhelm his obscure opponent, and the famous duel began, which was to rivet national attention and give Lincoln a national prominence. The challenge on Lincoln's part was a piece of superb generalship. In such a contest, he had everything to gain and nothing to lose. Whatever the result, the fact that he had crossed swords with so renowned a man as Stephen A. Douglas would give him a kind of reflected glory. But, in addition to that, he had the better side of the question. His course was simple. He was seeking the support of anti-slavery people. Douglas's task was much more complex, for he wished to offend neither Northern nor Southern Democrats, and he soon found himself offending both. To carry water on both shoulders is always a risky thing to attempt, and Douglas soon found himself fettered by the awkward position he was forced to maintain, while Lincoln, free from any such handicap, could strike with all his strength. His stand from the first was a bold one, so bold that many of his followers regarded it with consternation and disapproval. In his speech accepting the nomination, he had said, I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. It will become all one thing or all the other. And he pursued this line of argument in the debates alleging that the purpose of the pro-slavery men was to make slavery perpetual and universal and pointing to recent history in proof of the assertion. When asked by Douglas whether he considered the Negro his equal, he answered, In the right to eat the bread which his own hand earns, he is my equal and the equal of Judge Douglas, and the equal of every living man. 
he was not an abolitionist and declared more than once that he had no purpose directly or indirectly to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists that he had no lawful right to do so but only to prohibit it in any new country which is not already cursed with the actual presence of the evil even so skillful a debater as douglas soon found himself hard put to answer lincoln's arguments without offending one or the other of the powerful factions whose support he must have to reach the presidency at the beginning his experience and adroitness gave him an advantage which however lincoln's earnestness and directness soon overcame tens of thousands of people gathered to hear the debates they were printed from end to end of the country and lincoln loomed larger than ever before the nation but so far as the immediate result was concerned douglas was the victor for the election gave him a majority of the legislature and he was chosen to succeed himself in the senate yet more than once he must have regretted that he had consented to cross swords with his lank opponent for he had been forced into many an awkward corner there is a popular tradition that the presidential nomination came to lincoln unsought but this is anything but true on the contrary in those debates with douglas he was consciously laying the foundation for his candidacy two years later he used every effort to drive douglas to admissions and statements which would tell against him in a presidential campaign while he himself took a position which would ensure his popularity with the republican party so his defeat at the time was of no great moment to him he had gained an entrance to the national arena and he took care to remain before the public he made speeches in ohio in kansas and even in new york and throughout new england everywhere making a powerful impression to disunion and secession he referred only once or twice for he perceived a truth which even yet some of us are reluctant to admit that every nation has a right to maintain by force if it can its own integrity and that a portion of a nation may sometimes be justified in struggling for independent national existence the whole justification of such a struggle lies in whether its cause and basis is right or wrong so beneath the question of disunion was the question as to whether slavery was right or wrong on this question of course northern opinion was practically all one way while even in the south there were many enemies of the institution the world was outgrowing what was really a survival of the dark ages when the campaign for the presidential nomination opened in the winter of eighteen fifty nine eighteen sixty lincoln was early in the field and did everything possible to win support he secured the illinois delegates without difficulty and when the national convention met at chicago in may the contest soon narrowed down to one between lincoln and william h seward let it be said at once that seward deserved the nomination if high service and party loyalty and distinguished ability counted for anything and it looked for a time as though he were going to get it for on the first ballot he received seventy one more votes than lincoln but in the course of his public career he had made enemies who were anxious for his defeat his campaign managers were too confident or too clumsy to take advantage of opportunity lincoln's friends were busy and by some expert trading of which be it said in justice to lincoln he himself was ignorant succeeded in securing for him a majority of the votes on the third ballot so blindly and almost by chance was the nomination secured of the one man fitted to meet the crisis the only other event in american history to be compared with it in sheer wisdom was the selection of washington to head the revolutionary army a selection made primarily not because of washington's fitness for the task but to heal sectional differences and win the support of the south to a war waged largely in the north the nomination so curiously made was received with anything but enthusiasm by the country at large honest abe the rail splitter might appeal to some but there was a general doubt whether after all rail splitting however honorable in itself was the best training for a president however the anti-slavery feeling was a tie that bound together people of the most diverse opinions about other things and a spirited canvas was made greatly assisted by the final and suicidal split in the ranks of the democracy which placed in nomination two men Lincoln's old antagonist, Stephen A. Douglas, representing the northern or moderate element of the party, and John C. Breckinridge of Kentucky, representing the southern or extreme pro-slavery element. And this was just the corner into which Lincoln had hoped, all along, to drive his opponents.
Had the party been united, he would have been hopelessly defeated, for in the election which followed, he received only a little more than one-third of the popular vote. But this was sufficient to give him the northern states, with 180 electoral votes. But let us remember that in 1860, Abraham Lincoln was a choice for president of very much less than half the people of the country. The succeeding four months witnessed the peculiar spectacle of the South leisurely completing in arrangements for secession, and perfecting its civil and military organization, while the North, under a discredited ruler of whom it could not rid itself until March 4th, was unable to make any counter-preparation or to do anything to prevent the diversion of a large portion of the arms and munitions of the country into the southern states. It gave the southern leaders, too, opportunity to work upon the feelings of their people, more than half of whom in the fall of 1860 were opposed to disunion. It should not be forgotten that, however fully the South came afterwards, to acquiesce in the policy of secession, it was, in its inception, a plan of the politicians, undertaken, to a great extent, for purposes of self-aggrandizement. They controlled the conventions which, in every case except that of Texas, decided whether or not the state should secede. We can make better terms out of the Union than in it, was a favorite argument and many of them dreamed of the establishment of a great slave empire in which they would play the leading parts to the southern leaders then the election of lincoln was the striking of the appointed hour for rebellion south carolina led the way declaring on december seventeenth eighteen sixty that the union now subsisting between south carolina and other states under the name of the united states of america is hereby dissolved mississippi Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas followed. Opinion at the North was divided as to the proper course to follow. Horace Greeley, in the New York Tribune, said that the South had as good a right to secede from the Union as the colonies had to secede from Great Britain. And, as Greeley afterwards observed, the Tribune had plenty of company in these sentiments. Meanwhile, the Southern Confederacy had been formed. General Davis elected president, and steps taken at once for the organization of an army. Everyone was waiting anxiously for the inauguration of the new president, waiting to see what his course would be. They were not left long in doubt. His inaugural address was earnest and direct. He said, The union of these states is perpetual. No state upon its own mere motion can lawfully get out of the union. I shall take care that the laws of the Union are faithfully executed in all the states. It was, in effect, a declaration of war, and was so received by the South. Whether or not it was a constitutional attitude need not concern us now. The story of Lincoln's life for the next five years is a story of the Civil War. How Lincoln grew and broadened in those fateful years, how he won men by his deep humanity, his complete understanding, his ready sympathy, how, once having undertaken the task of conquering rebellion, he never faltered nor turned back despite the awful sacrifices which the conflict demanded. All this has passed into the commonplaces of history. No man ever had a harder task, and no other man could have accomplished it so well. The emancipation of the slaves, which has loomed so large in history, was in reality merely an incident, a war measure taken to weaken the enemy, and justifiable, perhaps, only on the grounds the preliminary proclamation, indeed, proposed to liberate the slaves only in such states as were in rebellion on the following 1st of January. Nor did emancipation create any great popular enthusiasm. The congressional elections which followed it showed a great reaction against anti-slavery. The Democrats carried Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, Illinois. For a time, the administration was fighting for its life, and won by an alarmingly small margin. Before the year had elapsed, however, there was a great reversal in public opinion, and at the succeeding election, Lincoln received 212 out of 233 electoral votes. The end of the Confederacy was by this time in sight. A month after his second inauguration, Richmond fell, and five days later, Lee surrendered his army to General Grant. Lincoln at once paid a visit to Richmond, and then returned to Washington for the last act of the drama. The 14th of April was Good Friday, and the President arranged to take a small party to Ford's Theater to witness a performance of a farce comedy called Our American Cousin. 
The president entered his box about nine o'clock and was given a tumultuous reception. Then the play went forward quietly, until suddenly the audience was startled by a pistol shot, followed by a woman's scream. At the same instant, a man was seen to leap from the president's box to the stage, pausing only to wave a dagger which he carried in his hand and to shout, Sic Semper Tyrannis. The man disappeared behind the scenes. Amid the confusion, no efficient pursuit was made. The president had been shot through the head, the bullet passing through the brain. Unconsciousness, of course, came instantly, and death followed in a few hours. Eleven days later, the murderer, an actor by the name of John Wilkes Booth, was surrounded in a barn where he had taken refuge. He refused to come out, and the barn was set on fire. Soon afterwards, the assassin was brought forth with a bullet at the base of his brain, whether fired by himself or one of the besieging soldiers was never certainly known. It is startling to contemplate the fearful responsibility which Booth assumed when he fired that shot. So far from benefiting the South, he did it incalculable harm, for the North was thoroughly aroused by the deed. Thousands and thousands flocked to see the dead president as he lay in state at the Capitol and in the larger cities in which his funeral procession paused on its way to his home in Springfield. The whole country was in mourning. As for its father, business was practically suspended, and the people seemed stunned by the great calamity. That so gentle a man should have been murdered wakened, deep down in the heart of the North, a fierce resentment. The feelings of kindliness for a vanquished foe were, for the moment, swept away in anger, and the North turned upon the South with stern face and shining eyes. The wild and foolish assassin brought down upon the heads of his own people such a wrath as a great conflict had not awakened. We shall see how bitter was the retribution. Not then so fully as now was Lincoln's greatness understood. He has come to personify for us the triumphs and glories, the sadness and the pathos of the great struggle which he guided. His final martyrdom seems almost a fitting crown for his achievements. It has, without doubt, done much to secure him the exalted niche which he occupies in the hearts of the American people, whom, in a way, he died to save. Had he lived through the troubled period of Reconstruction which followed, he might have emerged with a fame less clear and shining, and yet the hand which guided the country through four years of civil war was without doubt the one best fitted to save it from the misery and disgrace which lay in store for it. But speculations as to what might have been are vain and idle. What was, we know, and above the clouds of conflict, Lincoln's figure looms serene and venerable. Two of his own utterances reveal him as the words of no other man can. His address on the battlefield of Gettysburg and his address at his second inauguration, but two months after he was laid to rest. James Russell Lowell, at the services in commemoration of the 300th anniversary of Harvard College, paid him one of the most eloquent tributes ever paid any man, concluding with the words, Great captains, with their guns and drums, disturb our judgment for the hour, but at last silence comes. These all are gone, and standing like a tower, our children shall behold his fame, the kindly earnest, brave, foreseeing man, sagacious, patient, dreading praise, not blame, new birth of our new soil, the first American. End of chapter 4, part 1 Recording by William Tomko